hey guys, guess what? It's Thursday. Thursday, what a concept. Remember that one? Uh, it's still going, according to me. And that means Thursday is time for the Nerd Log. Uh, it's noon uh, in Portland. It's beautiful, beautiful weather out here. Everyone should be outside, but it turns out I don't like going outside anymore. I just want to be inside. When it's safe, I went to go get my vaccine and it gave me a panic attack being around that many people. That's not what the show's about. We've got some great, great guests. We have three guests today because we have a jam-packed episode and it is it is a log jam. We're talking entirely about logs today. Uh, Aaron, say hi. You're your third time, I think, uh, co-hosting, Aaron. So congratulations on that. As soon as I picked up my water bottle, that's when you were going to do my introduction. Exactly. I knew it. Like, exactly. <laughs> you were timing it just perfectly. You're yeah, also Center my... Square, though, now, which is, which is back when they did Hollywood Squares. That was the funniest person. So congratulations. That's a lot to live up to, to be honest. I've never seen Hollywood Squares, but I'll take your, your uh, word for it being funny. Um, yeah, so I think third time, I think. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah, third, yeah, third time, time. Um, on their blog. I am a principal developer relations engineer here at um, New Relic, and I'm on Twitch an awful lot, but more so on my own channel over our Bassett Dev. So um, you can follow me there or just keep watching Nerdlog. I'll be back here again. Awesome. And uh, with us, we have Rebecca is here. Rebecca, why don't you say hi to the people? Tell them what you do at New Relic. Hey, everyone. I'm Rebecca. I'm a product manager on the logging team, primarily in terms of the logging UI. Uh, before that, I was an engineer on the logging team. Um, so yeah, that's me. Nice. I, I, I love when we actually get like product team people, you know, here, which has been a big evolution of the uh, of the the process, which I really, really like. I see now that the top of my head is missing from our little multi-up, which means you can't see my hair and I have to fix that. No. Okay, I think it's in. I did a curl process. You know it's important. Julian's also here. Julian is the end all and be all of logs. It's been such a fun week rehearsing. Julian, uh, say hi to the people and tell them what you do for New Relic. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Senior Director of Product, which is a fancy way of saying I am the product owner of New Relic Logs and NRDB, our magic database. And just shouting out straight to Aaron, right down the camera, this is my second time. I'm coming for you. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's been really, it has been fun getting rehearsed, uh, getting rehearsed and talking about logs. Uh, uh, the, the fun fact about myself that I share every week as if it is new information is that I actually got my start in tech in new relic support way back in the day, uh, answering, you know, emails and, and, and debugging, uh, people's dashboards in ways that I absolutely cannot do now. I was recently asked to do some of that and I was like, Oh boy, I don't know how any of this works anymore. Um, so that means I have like pretty old experience at New Relic, but but Julian's got me got me pipped because I believe you actually started before me then. I think you've been here like a decade, yeah? Yeah, I have just cleared a decade. So uh, that is a terrifying sentence unto itself. But I was the first engineer hired in San Francisco. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were doing like something kind of like data enablement at the time uh, i i did i mean everything the company was tiny then i was Long the 45th employee been, right yeah absolutely i was doing yeah. a lot of subscription and user management so you know if folks are having problems with their users and their subscription it's probably standing on the sh shoulders of giants <laughs> which is to say the crumbling ruins of code <laughs> that i wrote 10 years ago that was back in the day when when you wanted when you like wanted to preview a feature, you just went in and gave yourself like Enterprise <laughs> Pro for life, uh, almost via a direct SQL query. But it was like maybe we had like a drop down of of like you had to get on the VPN to to give yourself that uh, yeah. SQL query. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but okay, so we're not here to talk about the history of New Relic because oh my god, uh, <laughs> that if this whole show is to inside, that would really be taking it to an another level. We're here to talk about logs. And I am super excited about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna like wax poetic for like two minutes, but um, you know when I talk when I sell talks about the kind of three pillars of observability, and we talk about metrics, uh, tracing, and logs, um, logs are like the deepest way to view your data, and they will contain the most exogenous causes. So the most obviously like, hey, there's something coming in from outside. It is what is causing this problem, and that is unexpected. And so when we kind of first interacted with logs in cloud data platforms like New Relic, it was like this side business. It's like, oh, if you want to zoom way in, you can see the logs too. 
right? But in the last two weeks, I have seen all these demonstrations of people building real complete and, and very deep dashboards based on logs data that, that really shows that, that if we kind of move logs up to first class in our thinking, we can, like the sky's the limit. All it requires is both obviously the sending of logs and a, a good deal of intelligence on the platform side, which maybe is not where we're gonna start, but we'll, let's, let's get into the UI, let's start looking at logs. Yeah, absolutely. So the logging product has been out for about 18 months now. Um, and I'm just really excited at all of the leaps and bounds that we've done uh, over that time. Um, so specifically with Rebecca, we wanted to walk you through some of the uh, newer, kind of more exciting things that we've been working on uh, and why you should care about it. So I think uh, first, first good place to start is the log patterns feature. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to kind of explain what that magic is. Really, while we're doing this, can you give me like one step of like zoom in and enhance our, 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 our enhance. message? Okay, all right, I'm feeling good about that one. I feel good. <laughs> Chat, let us know if that's like unreadable. I, I'm feeling pretty good about it. We can also, you know, toggle the table so we can maximize the, you know, the text if you want. Tons yeah. of options here. Yeah. So yeah well, Rebecca, like... take us through it. Yeah, so um, basically, you guys mentioned like logs are like, the deepest that you can go. Um, and they're the deepest you can go in an era, but they're also the deepest you can go in everything. So like logs are super verbose. There's a lot of them. Um, and just like most logs are not interesting or relevant to a troubleshoot for like when you're troubleshooting. So what patterns does is it groups logs into patterns. So you can like See, like, okay, like these are these kind of logs over here. Those are those kind of logs over there. And then it's a lot easier to like understand, like, okay, where are the interesting logs? Where are the relevant logs? Um, and that kind of thing. And what's really cool about the patterns is like, you know, you can see, like, okay, there's like, you know, 7.28 thousand logs that match this pattern. But you can also do the opposite and say, um, you know, what, where are the logs that are like one off? You know, like this is a lot that like only only comes up like once or twice. And that is like super valuable because like that's finding a needle in the haystack. Um, that's like sorting through all those like mountains of garbage to find like the one actual relevant log line. Yeah, I, I really do want to drill home that log data just does uh, towards being that hot exhaust pipe of garbage. Um, yeah, and so if, if I had like full zoom, if we're doing like the edited, you know, fun, wacky streamer stuff, I would just be zooming right in on hey, we've got three JSON parse errors out of 49,949 log lines. <laughs> now, I know all of us in reality, in real incidents, absolutely do scan through logs visually. Sometimes when we can see that, 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 that okay, we got a bunch of junk here, we'll, we'll reject stuff out and then try to scan you know, visually through that. But imagine finding three parsing errors out of again, 46,949. And that's like, in the last 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the ability to like pick that up and find that, it, I, my understanding is right, this is not, I didn't set this up. Like this account did not say, hey, show me JSON parse errors and, and mark them out. Is, is that right? Yeah, so Barack is gonna talk about this, who's the, the guest uh, in the later section. He'll go into depth about this, but yeah, like that's, that's completely right. The system has, uh, this really cool machine learning model that is specifically built around your data. And so this is something that that model has picked up relevant to this account's data. It All they did was start sending logs and here is the needle in the haystack. Uh, for me, what's really cool is what happens next after this, right? Like we've found this, you know, three occurrences of this pass error, but the log gives you the why. So let's go and find the occurrences of that error and try and get a better understanding of what's going on. All right, so I've done a search. We can see those three occurrences in the last 30 minutes. I can now click on that log line and this pulls up all of the metadata that's attached to that one log event. Um, because this log event came from uh, the new relic forwarder, we've got logs in context enabled. So there's the message, but we also have all kinds of really fun stuff. Like it's coming from Kubernetes. It has the Kubernetes pod ID attached to it. And it also has a trace and a span ID. So because New Relic understands how your hosts and your applications and Kubernetes and all these different things work together, we're able to link these things together and form a cohesive story. So with a click, 
I can actually see the health of that application, what's going on on the CPU. Um, because I've gone into maximum zoom, I have to scroll down to show all of the cool visualizations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we but do, also, the, sorry. The UI handles the zoom pretty well, but we do get a lot of visual space in there. Um, and so I can pick that trace ID and show surrounding logs, which reorients the data. Oh, this was the least interesting way to go and explore this data, but it reorients the data uh, to show the sequence, the before and after that led to this event in time. Um, so we can see that there is an order that came in uh, and specifically this order is what threw that error. So you know, maybe we need to go and get in touch with support, find out what happened with the customer um, and in turn go and jump into the code and trying to understand like, why did this request throw this, this error? Um, yeah, anything to add there, Rebecca? Um, yeah, just so like, let's say, you know, you're now you're searching for extra error um, and that log line is still, um, it still shows up in the query results that you had, you know, shown surrounding logs for. Um, and so it's going to keep its focus until you either turn it off or do a search that is, that it doesn't appear in. That's really cool. Just so you can like just keep the focus on the one log line that is like important to you. Yeah, and I, I apologize if I'm breaking the sequence, but this is something I, I, I truly love and I recommend that everybody who's using the Relic get better at is that, okay, so we have this query. Now in this case, right, this this event only happens occasionally, but let's say that this this error was super bad. It meant, you know, a payment had failed or or something, you know, really serious had happened with maybe a, a bad sound. Sounds like we should create an alert. Create yeah, alert. great segue, yeah. Nika. <laughs> yeah, this is the part, this is the part I love, so. <laughs> I get excited. I'm always like, oh, what about this? And like, well, I was getting to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rebecca. Yeah. yeah. So um, you can just click create alert condition and it already has the Nurgle for you. And it shows you a chart of how often this happens and like when you would have gotten alerted had you had this alert set up before. Um, and you can do some more configuration. And this has all the functionality of the alert UI. It's just easier because you can set it automatically from the login UI. Yeah, and um, I, I always like, if you scroll to the top of this, it, it gives you what the New Relic query language or Nurkle query is that, that gives this response. So if you wanna, you can also use the little three dots menu. If you wanna just say, hey, I wanna add this to a custom dashboard, of course you can do that. But I really like that we can just say, hey, I want an alert, you know, Im implicitly within this. Really, really nice. Yeah, um, and I mean, that's the point, right? Like log data by itself doesn't, it it is that, like high depth granularity, super high fidelity, but it's lacking in in the context as to why this is important to you. And mm -hmm. that's what that's really what we're trying to do, right? Like being able to at a click create an alert, and then when that alert fires, it takes you back into the logs. But that log can also take you into the application. It can take you into the host. So all from one alert, you can with single clicks, just see like, well, okay, I've had a CPU spike or my network's falling over or so just compact all of that data to something that's digestible. That's, that's really what we're striving for over in, over in logs land. Um, Cause otherwise it's just another logging product. I just want to like, just make sure I've got this correct. So all of that additional kind of meta information, all that context you're receiving there, that's not something you're, we have to like configure to send. That's just like goes as part of the log message by default, like it's so logging is there's like a million different ways to go and solve the problem in logging. And I'm I'm gonna try and not go on a soapbox here, but we are very I'm I'm like super inspired by the Rails framework. And so we've gone with a very uh, uh convention of a configuration. And so we've got we're very convention oriented here. Um when you install the infrastructure New Relic log forwarder, so you get I all of this. Liam, but I have a question from chat. Um, uh, Zubilar says that uh, their left panel doesn't show patterns. Is this an upcoming feature or something we need to license? Or just something I need to add to settings someplace? Ah. So popping our sequence a little bit, but. Yeah, excellent question. So this is going to be, it should be released to people at the moment. So that firstly makes me think, huh, well, hang on a sec. I need to go yeah. and chase that one down. Double but, check. We'll, we'll double check that one, Zubar. If you want to, um, if you want to like Twitter DM me, I can take a look at your account, make sure you actually have it. But, but we, there will be it's like an account level issue. There shouldn't be. This, uh, at the very least, we are in the process of uh, rolling things out at the moment. We finished all of our feature work last week, and we are officially launching all of these features Wednesday of next week. So this is like the kind of magical 
in betweens time uh, between the the launch. So if you don't see it now, you will see it by next Wednesday, and it will be available to all customers. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so rolling out, rolling out is probably our answer. But yeah, Zular and anyone else watching, especially those watching us from beyond the time tunnel, aka a YouTube replay, um, which I told you this, right? That like we get dozens of people showing up live, but then we have like a thousand people watching the replay now, which thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Extreme patience. I love you all. Uh, Getting all the um, future people. Thank you. But if, yeah, if you're missing this feature, uh, do feel free to DM me on Twitter. I will seriously come check it out. But uh, obviously, you know, support it in your relic.com. Hey, I'm missing this feature. Uh, Wednesday next week. If you're not seeing this, uh, check, check in. Um, okay. So uh, talk about getting attributes. So uh, some of them are going to be from like parsing the log line, right? Like, So some of them are. Um, we do a lot of, if I click on one of these log lines, a lot of this decoration happens uh, because you're using the infrastructure log folder, the neural like infrastructure log folder. And it understands the context of the host and it applies these entity goods on top of the data. Um, we do the same thing for applications. So we have uh, a log decorator for Java, Ruby, so on and so forth. Um, and they basically output your log lines in JSON. Uh, the infrastructure agent picks that up and does a little bit more decoration. And that's how we get all of these pivot points. That's how we get the trace ID and span ID all enriched and decorated. The product works fine if you, you know, like Telnet send a single log line to our HTTP endpoint. That'll still work, but it's just text. You don't get any of this metadata. The metadata okay. uh, comes through the forwarders. Okay, so even if you have, and, and and I mean this also be reasonable. I just I just want to make sure people are you know we're level setting is, even if you have like um, a, a very clear key value pair in that log line, you need to you need to use a forwarder or something to actually send it so that it has that as a parameter, e.g. like container name or or something like that. Uh, I mean there are, there's this massive bucket of a uh, can of worms here. Um, if you send a JSON object as your message payload, we'll break that out into key values and then, oh. and then they're just attributes. Yeah. Um, in turn, we also provide parsing as part of our ingestion pipeline where you can go and create Grok rules that'll extract data against your message. So this is my love. This is my love having Yanjali is, is we can't curveball you. You know, it's just, you, you know, like this is you not can funny. if you ask me to write Grok. <laughs> that's that's where the curveball comes. Could we write, write a quick awk, uh, a query, just <laughs> super quick? Let's just write a regex that uh, takes the numbers five through six or a number divisible by seven. That's all we need. And uh, what is it? Make it uh, a backward rec backwards recursion. I think that's yeah. one of the magic things that our fill our regex. We use RE2 on the back end, which is Google's uh, subset of regex that has um, a, a linear time processing, um, yeah. and it doesn't do uh, backwards. Yeah, uh, recursion. So that, like trying to try to match a subgroup within <laughs> the within the uh, a containing group. Like nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but uh, so. I, I really like this stuff about parsing. And one of the things I think is pretty basic, and I know we're going to touch on it again more later, is that um, fundamentally um, we, we, we do this kind of engineering around features for viewing, filtering, and controlling logs because you know this can be true of metrics, it can be true of traces, it can be true of a lot of other contexts, but you're very, very likely when you're working with logs at scale um, to not be in complete control of the source of the logs, yeah. right? When you're trying to make a dashboard based on logs, you're not able to go in. I mean, this is such a commonly requested feature for like the alerting and for, for pattern matching to say, you know, this uh, value is the same as this value. It's just a capitalization thing. Well, why don't you go and change it in, in the data you're sending? I can't, right? I mean, like, th this, is the, this is the world of logging. And we, we see this because we talk to customers all the time. Incidentally, yeah. uh, I always want to talk to customers. So Julian at neurolic.com. Uh, send me an email. I want to hear what you have to say. Where does it hurt? Um, there is this. There is a pretty big disconnect between the people that are configuring the log forwarders and the people that are using the product. Um, logging spans so many different personas. It can be support. It can be a security person. It can be ops, DevOps, software. Right. It. It, it can even be someone building BI dashboards. Um, but the the person that controls sending that data is almost always that ops or that DevOps person. Mm -hmm. And so if there is ever that disconnect between I'm a developer and you know, you're not passing out my log line correctly, 
it's it just it never happens you yeah. you just can't get that you know think of the change that needs to get, get made into a terraform config that needs to get rolled out across 2000 servers and then that's just for one one dev so we've really the the, the mantra that we have is we try and take as much of that processing away from being server side and into our ingestion pipeline. So yeah. we, we do have a lot of configuration options, drop filters, parsing. We even, and, and this is something that we can jump into, uh, have data partitioning, which is very uh, akin to the Elasticsearch index, uh, but way better, um, which it's, it's just, it allows you to add that layer of um, organization on top of your log data. It's, this is mainly applicable to companies that are, you know, sending terabytes on terabytes of log data. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about partitioning for a minute because like a pretty common situation you sort of for me the most obvious reason you want to like completely separate two data sets is because you have like prod and dev data sets. But uh, for me, you know, I'm always using the production tools to uh, fix my own terrible code. So, um, you know, when I'm in a situation this has happened to me before actually I thought about it after our rehearsal that I'll be sending logs up to the same endpoint and then I'll have messed something up and the system isn't working. And now I want to find just my dev logs, but there are millions of lines of production logs. And while they're there, while I can even maybe find them, I'm still having to wait, of course, for it to query a million lines to find me the three I actually need. So let's talk about partitions to try and separate out data to actually be able to like query super fast on like a little bitty subset. Right, so um, I want to give a little bit of context. The, the way that our logging platform works is all of your log data sits inside of NRDB, which is Neuralic's magic MapReduce database that we've created in-house. And it's, it's really, really cool. But the way that it works is it basically brute forces all of your log data, which means if you're sending literal terabytes a day, that's going to be a slower query for you to go and find all the failures, all the errors than if you're sending you know a couple hundred gig a day. Yeah. Um, so that data partitioning allows you to, to create buckets on, on the ingestion side, so you don't even need to configure anything at the log folder about things that you care about. Um, so ideally, these are things that are relatively static within your, your organization. Um, Rebecca, how about you kind of walk us through the value of data partitions and why we've created it? Yeah. So like, Let's say, like Mika, in your case, you have your dev logs um, and you want to be able to really like quickly and easily find them. And let's say like for like for the purposes of this demo, like all the tower services are your dev logs. And so you can um, Right. So you, you see here we've got tower data right alongside other other applications. All your data is in one place at the moment. And um, you're know, like, you know what? I want to separate those out. I don't want them to be like, I want to be able to easily just like find all my like dev stuff that's like on its own. Um, so you, you know, create a new partition, call it where you want log tower. Um, you can select the retention period, and that is you know either 30 days for GDPR or your your company's standard retention. Um, and like, you know, let's say for you, you're like, oh, these are dev logs. I don't need them. Like my company has like a year. They keep their production logs for a year. But I personally don't really need these logs for that long. So all this do 30 days. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, you have this partition now that is all the, all the logs that belong to a tower service. Now, when I first when I when I first heard about this, I of course thought, oh well, the, the goal is to cut down on retention to, to to save money on the new relic side, and of course I was wrong because I'm <laughs> wrong as I always am about about how new relic actually charges money. That the the purpose would be like, hey, we shouldn't be holding on to this data beyond a certain period because again, new relic charges at ingest. Um, if if anybody wants to go on hardcore pricing wonkishness, please invite not me to that conversation because <laughs> I do not. I, I, I like our pricing. I love that we have a free tier. I love that we that we let people get in. And I know that we have a very, very economical way to store data. But beyond that, I'm always a little bit ignorant. But yeah, the, like this could be very useful for like GPDR compliance, obviously, to say, hey, we only want to keep this for 30 days. Can data yeah. or can logs belong to multiple different data partitions or once it's in a partition, then it's in a partition? Yeah, so behind the scenes, we're creating a custom event type. Um, so a log can only belong to one data partition. Uh, so here I've gone and searched for all of our tower data 
you can see when that rule was created, we've had a pretty big drop off. Um, equally, if so, I go- so I didn't actually realize this before, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but so when you partition something, it's not just that it creates, not to like part the kimono too far here, or go too far into the, the like, you know, the behind the scenes stuff, but it not just, it doesn't just create a separate table with like a copy, it actually moves that data over into that. that it doesn't uh, move. It's it's a stream process. So it's okay, from yeah, that it's moment only, in time. Only, yeah, moving forward. Yeah. yeah. So like I have now changed my my data petition from the default log into the new log tower. When I run this query, we'll see exactly where this drops off. The new petition will have a ton of data. So that's where that handoff has happened. So the, the yeah. point of this, sorry, Rebecca, go for it. Oh, well, I was going to um, also say that, you know, when next time you come to log, you don't have to remember to, you know, check and uncheck boxes. You can just save this view. Um, Julian's going to save views and save the current view. Um, it's going to remember that you can, yeah, name it, the tower logs. It's going to remember the query, the, um, the columns you have, and the data partition. So next time you come, you can just like, click on that save view, and then you don't have to do any more configuration. Yeah, so this is, this is you know, troubleshooting. Um, I always want to look at my prod errors, that sort of thing. And this complements the data petitions in that you're really trying to narrow down the data that you care about. You know, uh, it's, it's your team, it's your AWS region. It's something relatively static that you know that you care about this subset of data. So, you know, Julian's team cares about the tower data. So every time I'm going to be troubleshooting and triaging and looking at the logs, why am I looking at anything else? This just means that we're scanning faster, visualizing faster, exploring faster. Um, and as I said, that's just a uh, um, different custom event type. So count. Uh, I'm gonna start. step away, uh, Aaron. You're 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 in charge briefly. Oh no, no, no. nobody wants I that. I know. We all know he's gonna go mad with power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, like. We've gone from uh, the log custom event type, the log event type into the log tower event type. Um, and so that's that's what's happening behind the scenes. So you can still go and create your visualizations and uh, explore your data. Um, the best thing is, as I said before, it just allows you to do it all side by side. So even though the data has been partitioned out into mm -hmm. um, custom events, you can go and query and see everything. Here's my tower data. And just to kind of prove that I'm not lying to you, it, it still is right side by side next to non tower logs. So you still have to retain that ability to search and, and visualize yeah. everything together in one place. But those petitions then, as you said, they, they only apply from the a point you create the petitions forward. So they're not going to apply to any log data retroactively. That's right. The data is immutable. Yeah. So it's something you want to think about early on when you start sending logs and is, is, it, is this going to belong to a partition and get it? into the correct partitions kind of as early as I mean, as you it's, can. it's never too late to start, you know? <laughs> yeah. What's it, the uh, the best time was 10 years ago, the second best time is today, that, that old phrase? Yeah, wow, yeah, I exactly. could have done with that saying 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rebecca, what else do we want to cover? Um, well, um, going back to like, patterns, um, you know, like one, one, one of the things about patterns, as we mentioned, like way back is that, you know, most, most of your largs are, most of your largs, most of your logs <laughs> are garbage. Um, and so, you know, with patterns, you can see like, I don't know, is this patterns or is this all logs? This is yeah, all I've logs. Just, I've look, just at, jumped, look at all those logs. Yeah, <laughs> I've, jumped into, <laughs> I've changed accounts. So we're into, a, uh, um, into the AIR, AIR ops account. Um, and so you can see that even scrolling the logs, there's something well, pretty obvious going on. Wait, yeah, a, AI, AIR, 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 <laughs> AIR, <laughs> AIR, what, what, is, what does AIR stand for? Oh, <laughs> stump me on that one. Oh. Uh, I'm going to leave that secret for Barack to explain. It's, okay, it's his right. team, what, no what the acronym no, of we'll AIR stands for. We'll get there. I thought, I thought we knew. We'll figure it out. Hey, no one's ever told me what YAML means, and I'm, st I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Yet another markup language. Oh, my God. You know, you know now the Wikipedia also reads with that 
flipping profligate lie that it's YAML inked markup language, which is completely wrong. I was around when it was only called yet another, and yet now, now, now Wikipedia just reads like, oh yeah, no, this is what it's always been called. I mean, didn't the same thing happen with PHP back in the day? Wasn't PHP the PHP hypertext preprocessor or something yes. like that? Yeah. Yes, it's like uh, PHP to... started off as personal home pages. That was its original one. Yeah, and then it became personal uh, PHP hypertext protest, uh, 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 processor yeah. Or, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, th those ones I love a lot more than the ones that are like slightly surly jokes. The YAML <laughs> one is, I'm a little, I'm a little too much like, uh, the, the, the. So what you're saying my, is my, everything is lies. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite one will always be twin. I don't think anything will ever top that. Just technology with like an interesting name. It's just like, we could be bored <laughs> to give a name for this, so. That's pretty good. <laughs> that is fantastic. Come on, that's better than pretty good. So, so looking at patterns. So, so we're back to patterns and there's one that really stood out to me. I wonder if we could, oh yeah, you can see uh, sort of towards the bottom here, you can see some that are marked as like, hey, this keeps coming in with a UUID. And I saw ones before that were like, hey, this keeps coming in with a URL. Yeah. Yeah, so remember when we were talking about parsing and Julian was like, don't ask me to learn Grok. Um, this is how, this is like automatic parsing and you don't even have to use Grok. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you wanna click on that one. So here you can see we've parsed out IPs um, and log pattern, it's because it's just new relic dots. So that's how you know it's something that we parsed out. Um, and now that's its own attribute and you can treat it like any other attribute in the log UI. Oh yeah, that's this really neat. I really, really like this. So then... You there you go. You want to see traffic by IP address? Uh, let's do, what is it, bot chart? There you go. Most of the traffic's coming from this IP address. The, as Rebecca said, the thing that like my mind flips out about is there was no configuration needed for this to work. Yeah, the ML model identified this is a log line that repeats and it repeats with an IP address. Well, let me get that for you. Yeah, so that classic like dev interview question, which uh, by the way, the first time I ever got given it, I screwed up very badly, which was what's the most frequent IP address in these logs, right? Um, which requires nothing but you know a little bit of regex and a little bit of unique, right, on the command line. But oh boy, this is a lot nicer. This is a lot nicer than that. And you know, a lot of us, frankly, these days are seeing logs in places where we can't use unique and regex, right? To parse it, right? When you're looking at the like um, CloudWatch logs, or you're looking at another endpoint, you are often paying by the query to even query it at all, and you don't have such a full like query ability. So being able to pattern match and say, hey, we already can see that this shows up this many times, oh, it's nice. Right, so we, we really do lean into this convention over configuration. So there's so many ways to leverage parsing for us. If you set a, a log type, for example, log type Nginx, we will treat your logs as if they're Nginx, we'll automatically apply Nginx uh, rules on top of it and extract out all that data. That's how you get your status code, your IP address. And that's just attaching log type Nginx to your log line. We support I don't know, 20 or 30 rules that way. You can also do grok parsing on ingestion. And then lastly, there's this magic, I don't even know what's going on, that it's just like, hey, I can see that this is repeating. I got this. Don't worry about it. So uh, by the way, we, uh, we, we told Barack that we had a very rare cask of Amontillado wine and then bricked him up in a basement where he could just scream about us <laughs> saying stuff inaccurately, including that we do not extract UUID. <laughs> We only do it URL and IP. That was my assumption. Uh, I guess what I was saying is that it can genericize and say, hey, this line is showing up and it contains a UUID, which obviously we're not going to go and let you fasten on for kind of... I mean, Nico, uh, what I'm hearing here is we are releasing this in a week. And so, well, we've got a week to work out how to get UIDs. <laughs> UID. <meditated> get it, <laughs> get it and shipped into prod. <laughs> Actually, you, you won't be on camera, Brock, for, you know, 15 minutes. So I don't understand what the big deal is. This is me okay, wanting to so do I always, prod. have we changed it? So it's TDD is now Twitch driven development. Is this how this works? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what looks good on stream. This is, you know, my, one of my besties just moved into project management. And so I want to be prepared to make that same leap. So I just want to say, it doesn't seem that hard to me. Uh, 
<laughs> it worked on my laptop. When I was when I was coding stuff badly that didn't work and would crash the database server, it was pretty easy to implement those features. <laughs> um, one thing that uh, I know Rebecca wants to talk about is that we have just this massive spike of data here, like this one log yeah. line. Over 7 million long messages that are all being ingested that like this team is paying for. I mean, they're not paying for it because they work at New Relic, but um, you yeah. know. That's, that's a lot of log messages that, um, I mean, it doesn't look interesting to me. So like, that sucks. Um, right, so but, the idea here is, you know, does logs are super verbose. Does it deliver value? Are you getting what you're paying for? What's, what's the point in searching against all of these things if every query you run is gonna start by removing this from your, from your query? Well, I mean, here's the thing. It has told me a few times that Kafka Data Consumer is not running in uninterruptible thread. It, it mentioned it 7.09 million times, but I didn't quite get it. I was like, could you mention it 100,000 more times? And then I will, I, will, I will hear you. Yeah. So, yeah, in your case, maybe you, we should keep on. We should keep them. Know. But should, otherwise, yeah, maybe we, we do want to look into a config issue. Hey, yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll let Kafka Data Consumer run as an uninterruptible thread. I don't know. There you go. Yeah. Four million but, times in 24 hours. Yeah, sorry, I keep cutting Rebecca off. Go for it. But you don't even need to go into the configuration because you can create a drop filter from the UI and you can say, you know, don't like just drop these, don't ingest them. Oh, don't waste wow. time with this message. Oh, that is nice. So we, this, you know, we, we've begun rolling this feature out. Uh, it's rolled out to about 10 customers. It'll be out to everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm getting my features confused. Patents has begun the rollout. We have rolled this, this out to more than 10 customers though. Um, and we've actually had a real world case of a customer sending about 40% of their multiple terabytes of log data was just a single message repeating over and over again that had no value in it. And so they were able to save 40% of their egress costs, 40% of their log costs, 40% less things to search against, right? And like, that's the power of patterns. It's just a single click and you can be like, are you getting value out of this? So um, how do you drop patterns? Like at what level does that prevent it getting sent? Is that at the, it's probably it's not at like the log sender level, right? It's like the ingest level. So many ways to skin a cat with logs, uh, specifically all of these dials are on ingestion. So yeah. if you drop using these drop filters, you will not be charged uh, the new relic fee Ooh, of storing that nice. data. Yeah, that's nice. It's pretty rad to be all the way here at the web interface and be able to say, hey, I'm gonna cut our data ingest. That's pretty nice. Yeah, I, this is not encouraging you to send debug logs and just drop them all because you will face <laughs> a very steep egress cost from AWS or whoever else is, yeah. is judging yeah. to egress it. But it's it's basically to say like, why am I sending this? I can't control it. It's being sent, but I can now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with the drop filters, can you? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Aaron, go ahead. I was going to ask, like, so with the drop filters, we keep doing the filters and things on message. I think we can filter on different attributes of the, the logs as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yes, on, on everything. Oops. So Stupid. I could, like, filter on the log level because filtering out everything that's, like, warning or error seems a lot easier than fixing them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Do not take this as advice. Do not do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, so for those playing along from home, just do be conscious that like you know logs cost in a couple of ways. New Relic, I don't, I do not want to get into again into a pricing discussion. I, if you have AES, they will give you very good knowledge about this. But um, New Relic ingest is probably the cheaper part of what you're doing. Um, and even if you are just sending you know to our ingest straight from your hard drive somewhere, I guarantee it's the cheapest part of what you're doing because while you may not be paying cash for your log storage, you sure as heck are paying in human costs of managing and keeping track of your log rotate. So uh, be aware if you're using you know the uh, 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 you know uh, Godzilla sized service, right? If you're using AWS, that you know a, a, a big contributor is egress cost. So um, that's uh, unavoidable, right? You know, uh, but if you're seeing something that's uh, you know, ninety percent of your log traffic. It's really, really cool to be able to drop it from, uh, you know, our our data consumption. Like that's very, very neat. 
it is obviously worth looking at like if you're sending that from aws like how can i maybe cut down on that a little bit yeah and um, you can configure that in log forward is very easily um it's, this is really more of that fine tuning dial so uh, aaron yeah. you asked can i do it on anything aside from message anything that you can search on you can create a rule around so you can see here it's just nurkle which everything under the hood is nurkle so if you can search for it you can create a rule around it and you can also everything. Facebook is just mm -hmm. Nurkle run very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also just oh. drop attributes. So if you're like, I don't want to, I want to see the message, but I don't want to know if it's an error log. You're just stressing me out. Um, you can drop that <laughs> attribute. Yeah. Also, possibly maybe we're sending the attribute like phone number or or <laughs> location of children's beds. We could say, hey, you know what? Yes, we should stop sending this, but also let's stop adjusting it too. Yeah, uh, PAI yeah. data should be uh, not sent from your server, but <laughs> also true. Yeah. Um. You know, th this this does bring me back to like really, I, I I this is answers to sort of what I always saw is that kind of the two most common questions around logs and especially logs of like odd exogenous events is one is like, how do I get out this PII, which we've, we've long done, you know, some level of filtering for this stuff automatically. It's really nice to see this, you know, it, it expanding. Um, the other one is kind of a basic question, which is um, this one thing happening is very, very bad. Uh, and so I want to be notified if it happens even once. So an example of that is, you know, I always think of this like e-commerce example. Yeah, drop the drop the file in that line number attributes. We don't we don't need that. <laughs> Make it fun for us. Um, is so an example of that is like uh, the, maybe there's a state in your e-commerce checkout where the user is going to get charged, but an order is not going to be created. Right, like it's a failure along that path. Um, which obviously is very bad and, you know, can sink your little e-commerce company. So um, one of the things that's really standing out here is the ability to do this filtering and zoom way in on a single log line type and then say, hey, I want to alert or create events based on this. That seems very, very powerful. Um, we have better tools for eventing off that stuff now and uh, off of a single query. So that really, really matters. Yeah. So... Hey, inventory service, perfect, yeah. Yeah, right? It, yeah, we, we really are very much focused on um, how can we move a lot of that configuration pain into a, a pleasant UI for you to control? Because, um, you know, finding that needle in the haystack only gets harder when you don't have all the tools at your disposal to make life easy for yourself. Mm -hmm. Setting up a grok filter, setting up parsing rules in a YAML file is hard when it's on a server. You need yeah. to restart your forwarder to make sure it works. And if it doesn't work, you've just now you've got a backlog of a gig of logs that you need to go on burn through. Like it's it's hard, it's risky. And so we're we're de-risking that for you. We're taking on that pain. And it's it's just part of the new relic offering, right? Like go and set up some, don't do this, but go and set up some expensive parsing rules, right? And and like it's free. You don't get charged for the CPU cycles. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't mind Bitcoin with regex. Yeah. Don't don't go <laughs> don't go over the top. Uh, know your no know, know your limits with regex, you know. Uh, be safe. Yeah. Enjoy enjoy responsibly. There we go. Enjoy <laughs> responsibly. Rules to live by with regex. Enjoy responsibly. <laughs> <laughs>